Hi guys, it's Janice. Let's talk about malignant hyperthermia, something that is fairly rare, affecting only one in every 100,000 patients. However, the mortality rate has been reported as high as 80%, and it is something that we could see in the ED. So what is malignant hyperthermia? It is a life-threatening clinical syndrome of hypermetabolism, which involves the skeletal muscle. The crisis is a biomechanical chain reaction response that occurs in the skeletal muscle cells of susceptible individuals, and it's triggered by commonly used general anesthetics and paralyzing or neuromuscular blocking agents like succinylcholine. Malignant hyperthermia is not an allergy, but it's an inherited disorder that is found both in humans, pigs, and horses. The exact incidence of malignant hyperthermia is not known. About one in every 2,000 patients harbor a genetic change that makes them susceptible to malignant hyperthermia. There's over 80 genetic defects that have been associated with malignant hyperthermia. And susceptibility is inherited with an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. There is scientific information possibly linking malignant hyperthermia to certain muscle disorders such as muscular dystrophy. In malignant hyperthermia, the patient's temperature may elevate as much as one to two degrees Celsius every five minutes, and the patient may have a fever that exceeds 110 degrees Fahrenheit. However, even when treated properly, a patient in malignant hyperthermia crisis may still have an increase for morbidity and mortality due to either cardiac arrest, brain damage, kidney failure, muscle damage or other major organ impairment due to the event. And death is usually resulting from the cardiovascular collapse. How do we recognize malignant hyperthermia? First, be on the lookout whenever we're giving succinylcholine in the ED. One of the earliest and most reliable signs of malignant hyperthermia is going to be a rise in the end tidal CO2 or hypercapnia. Often those numbers can exceed 100 millimeters of mercury. Remember the normal being 35 to 45. The patient can have tachycardia due to the catecholamine surge. They can have ma uh, masseter muscle rigidity. They can be tachypnic, but that would only be seen if they were spontaneously breathing. Um, hypoxia patients with malignant hyperthermia can have up to a threefold increase in their oxygen consumptions. They can have arrhythmias, and again, that's due to, the, due to the catecholamine surge, and they can also have ischemic demands on their heart. They can have an unstable blood pressure, flushed, cyanotic, or ruddy skin. The late signs of malignant hyperthermia include fever and diaphoresis. The hypermetabolism evokes a massive exothermic response, leading to a very high temperature elevation. The sustained elevation of calcium allows excessive stimulation of aerobic and anaerobic glycolytic metabolism, which accounts for respiratory and metabolic acidosis. Labs that can be high include potassium, calcium, magnesium, glucose, the CK, LDH, SGOT. The potassium increase is due to rhabdo and the breakdown of muscle cells, as well as the CK. And the serum lactate can be up to 15 to 20 times more than normal in patients with malignant hyperthermia. Labs that can be low include your clotting factors. These patients can go into DIC as well. And then they can have myoglobinemia. So what's causing all the problems? It has to do with the calcium. So here on the right, you have a cross-section of a muscle fiber, what looks like a little potato there in the middle. That is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then the little green antenna-like things or upside-down legs, that's the calcium channel that's releasing the calcium ions. And that is what causes contraction in a normal muscle. So in malignant hyperthermia, there's a massive buildup of calcium in the skeletal muscle, which leads to a massive hypermetabolic state. All right, we have our patient in the ED. We've just given succinylcholine. This patient happens to have the abnormal calcium channels, and that is a triggering agent for them. The first thing we're going to see is a rising end tidal CO2. Again, those numbers can exceed 100. And then they can have tachycardia and dysrhythmias. They can have the masseter muscle tension. They can have muscle rigidity. Here it is in a pig before uh, administering succinylcholine and then after. 
They can have a falling O2 sat. They can be tachypnic. Again, that's only if they're breathing spontaneously. They can have the dark urine, so going to rhabdo. They can have acid base abnormal abnormalities, high potassium, high CK, high uh, lactate. And then the rising temp, even though it's called malignant hyperthermia, that is the later sign that we would see. Now we've recognized malignant hyperthermia, what are our action steps? What are we going to do to treat it? First of all, here at Highland, we're going to call the OR. Why the operating room? Because they're the ones that have the malignant hyperthermia cart that has the dantrolene. Dantrolene is the treatment for malignant hyperthermia. Remember, one of the triggering agents that can cause malignant hyperthermia includes general anesthesia. So our immediate action steps are going to include stopping the procedure, hyperventilating the patient with 100% O2, designating two people to reconstitute the dantrolene and administer it, insert arterial lines and central venous lines, send ABGs and chemistries, insert a urinary catheter, and actively cool the patient. That can include ice normal saline, surface cooling, and lavage. So what is dantrolene? Dantrolene is the antidote. It decreases the loss of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum in the skeletal muscle and restores normal metabolism. So it is in the OR's malignant hyperthermia cart, and in their cart they have 36 vials of dantrolene. Dantrolene can only be reconstituted with sterile water. Anything else may cause the solution not to reconstitute properly. So what's the dose? It's going to be to administer 2.5 milligrams per kilogram IV push over one to two minutes. That dose can go up to 10 milligrams per kilogram or until the patient's temperature starts to decrease. So let's say that we have a 70 kilo patient and we want to give the lower dose of the 2.5 milligrams per kilogram. It would be 170 milligrams would be the dose. That's nine vials of dantrolene. And if we wanted to go with the upper end, it would be 10 milligrams times 70. That would be 700 milligrams. That would be 35 vials of dantrolene that would need to be given. All right, phew, we got the patient out of crisis. Now what? Transfer them to the ICU for the next 24 hours, making sure that they don't have any risk of recurrence. Dantrolene can continue to be given one milligram per kilogram or more, whatever dose is working for them, every four to six hours for the next 36 hours, or they may need further doses as well. And then vital signs, of course, labs, counsel the patient and family member regarding malignant hyperthermia, and then um, further precautions, so not to have general anesthesia or be around the triggering agent, and then refer the patient to the Malignant Hyperthermia Association of the United States, their uh, website, and then um, there is an adverse metabolic reaction to anesthesia form on this same website that should be completed and sent to them as well. So this is what the Malignant Hyperthermia Association for the U.S. looks like, and their hotline number is there. It's for healthcare workers and for patients as well. Here's the references. Thanks for listening.